Good morning again here from the United Church of Asonet. Thank you once again for joining us here on YouTube. Our meditation this morning is Jesus. Thank you for being the light in my darkness. Help me to trust and keep going. And this comes from our daily bread. Our call to worship today comes from Psalm 50. The Mighty One, God the Lord, speaks and summons the earth from the rising of the sun to its setting. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God shines forth. Our God comes and does not keep silence. Before him is a devouring fire and a mighty tempest is all around him. He calls to the heavens above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Gather to me my faithful ones who made a covenant with me by sacrifice. The heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge. Our opening hymn this morning is O Wondrous Sight, O Vision Fair. shall share which Christ upon the mountain shows where brighter than the sun he glows with shining face and bright array Christ deigns to manifest that day what glory shall be theirs above who joy in God with perfect love and faithful hearts are raised on high by this great vision's mystery for which in joyful strains we raise the voice of prayer, the hymn of praise. And now let the Holy Spirit join us wherever we are and wherever we may be in this invocation. Holy One, on mountaintops and valley floors, you reveal to us the light of your love. Our heart's desire is to bask in the amazing glory of the Divine Presence. With each encounter, we are changed and transformed. Draw us nearer that we might receive a double portion of your Holy Spirit. Help us, O Holy One, to live our lives as a reflection of divine glory. May we walk among our siblings and friends as a blessing, bring light into dark places, hope to displace despair, and love that casts out hate. Our world is hurting, and we need the followers of Jesus to follow more closely. Maybe then we will hear your voice speaking to us and saying, Listen to my Son, the Beloved. And let us pray as that beloved son taught us by saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be.
We have several announcements this morning. The flowers and the altar were provided by Jeff and Cheryl Field. Uh, the church council will um, decided that we will maintain these virtual services through February 28th. Uh, the council will re-examine our plans for March at their meeting to be held next Sunday on the 21st, and we will certainly let you know what they decide. Uh, the last week of our Bible study on Paul's first letter to the Corinthians will be this Tuesday. Uh, it'll be at 6 p.m., and we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 58, as we sort of wrap everything together. You can again email me at revgregorynbaker at outlook.com if you'd like a Zoom link or if you have any questions. Uh, then the following Tuesday, we'll be starting our Lenten study here at our church, which is Entering the Passion of Jesus by Amy Jill Levine. It uh, starts again Tuesday, February 23rd at 7 p.m. We're going to be examining the famous stories of Holy Week to see the risks that Jesus takes and which risks we can make for our faith. Again, please send me an email if you're interested in that. Uh, the other Bible study series is the Ecumenical Bible Series, uh, which will begin on Wednesday, February 24th at 7 p.m. The theme this year is health and healing in the Bible. And because of social distancing, we will not be sharing soup together, but we will be meeting through Zoom only. Again, look for that invitation via email. There may also be information on the East Freetown Congregational Christian Church Facebook page. Uh, then uh, next Sunday um, will be the St. John Newman Church's virtual Lenten Day service, Repent and Believe in the Gospel. That will be held at 7 p.m. on Sunday, February 21st. And that information can be found at www.facebook.com slash St. John Newman Catholic Church. Uh, again, thank you for the fields, for the flowers. We're always looking for more help uh, for weeks to come. Uh, please call Kathy Frazier at 508-644-5448 if you would like to help us out. And Kathy and I are here on Fridays recording the service and also uh, here if you have any questions for us. And also, if you do have any prayer requests, I again ask that you please email those to me uh, by Friday so I can include them in our worship service. And it is now the time where we lift up those very joys and our concerns to God. We have our continuing prayers this week for Manny Santos, Susan Lemos, Christine Vaughn, for Gloria, Barbara Flanders, Leon Cudworth Sr., Jack Conway, Jen Currier, Betty O'Leary, and Rachel Abbott. We have some news about Mike O'Leary. He is finally out of the hospital and recovering at home. So hopefully uh, he'll be back on his feet very soon. Also received a prayer request today about Patty Chase, who is the barber at the uh, haircut store. Uh, her mother passed away this week from the coronavirus. So our prayers are with Patty and her family this week. And now let us unite ourselves in one spirit of prayer. Transforming God, you have given us a vision of your glory in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hear us as we bring to you our own lives to be transformed by you through your redeeming presence amidst this community. In a world which can so easily become dull to the wonder of your glory, we pray that we would reflect your light, awakening all of those who come near us to your spirit which dwells within us. Open us to the needs of those who pass our way. Help us to serve you by serving them in the spirit of your Son, who showed us the way to life in its fullness. Give us grace to honor his name in the life which we build together. To those who hunger, make of us bread. To those who lack shelter, make of us to be a home. For those who are lost and lonely, make of us the peace and joy of Christ to them. May we bring hope and a future to those lives which are growing dim. We pray for all those touched by the coronavirus and who struggle to make the vaccine available. We pray for all of our friends and family in need, remembering especially this day, Manny, Susan, Christine, Gloria, Barbara, Leon, Jack, Jen, Betty, Mike, Rachel, and Patty. We ask, O oh Lord, that you hear the silent prayers of our hearts and open our hearts that we may hear your word for us.
Lord, lead us in your righteousness. Make your way plain before our faces. For it is you alone, O God, who makes us to dwell in safety. As we hear your word, speak to us once again, and let us experience Christ anew in celebration and praise. We offer these in all of our prayers in Christ's name. Amen. You may have noticed that it is cold outside this week, and we would certainly appreciate your help in uh, keeping our building warm and also for all the other ministries that we do here at our church and here in our community. We really appreciate all of your generosity and ask that at this time when we don't have our live worship to please mail your checks to P.O. Box 155, Assonant, Massachusetts, 02702. You can also give via PayPal by going to uccassonant.com. And now let us think about the love of this marvelous holiday as we have a time of meditation. The lesson this morning comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verses 3 to 6. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And our gospel lesson today comes from the gospel according to Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. 
Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, everybody, today is Valentine's Day. And to be honest, it's a pretty strange holiday. There are the fancy dinners and special outfits, the flowers, chocolates, promises you don't intend to keep parts of the holiday. But before all that, there were the cards. You know, now we see these cards, these valentines, as a drugstore purchase or going to the paper store if you want to be really fancy about them. But in days of yore, they were small handcrafted signs of affection among spouses and lovers. Now, the connection of love with mid-February can be seen as far back as, I think, 1380, when Geoffrey Chaucer wrote in one of his poems, For this was on St. Valentine's Day, when every fowl cometh there to choose his mate. During those courtly medieval days with romantic knights and damsels in distress, the Valentine letter became a mark of true affection and devotion. But this then begs the question, who was St. Valentine and what does he have to do with love? Now, the early days of the church were fraught and hectic since before about 313, Christianity in the Roman Empire was tolerated at best and outlawed under penalty of death at worst. Many brave souls resisted the empire for their faith and many paid the ultimate price. Of these martyrs, many tales were told so the details often get confused or shrouded with legend. St. Valentine was just such a martyr whose story on the surface has very little to do with the holiday that now bears his name. The Valentine on whose feast day, Valentine whose feast day is February 14th, is Valentinus of Rome, a priest who was supposedly persecuted by the emperor Claudius Gothicus in around 270. He was sent under house arrest into the home of a judge named Asterius. And Asterius, as was his job as sort of the warden of a bunch of Christians under his house, hold was to try to convince Valentinus of the error of his ways. But Valentinus refused to budge in his faith in the power and love of Jesus. Then Asterius put him to the test and asked him to heal his adopted daughter who had been born blind. And as you might expect from this kind of story, Valentinus healed the girl, and then he converted Asterius, who then freed Valentinus and all the other Christians under his watch. As you might expect, this did not go over well with Emperor Claudius, who had Valentinus and Asterius executed. Now, all in all, one could say this was a fairly typical martyrdom story with a miracle that you could find uh, in many different collections of martyrdom stories or saints' lives. But over the years, more and more legends accumulated about this particular story, tying it into love and marriage. According to Father Frank O'Gara of the Whitefriars Street Church in Dublin, what Valentinus got into trouble about in the first place was that he was marrying Christian soldiers to their wives, something which apparently had been outlawed so that the soldiers would devote their full love and attention to the army and to the empire and not to their spouses. Other legends tell that on the night before his execution, Valentinus wrote a letter to Asterius' daughter, whom he loved perhaps romantically, signed, Your Valentine. And so it is the story of this letter that became the basis of the holiday, as lovers send their own valentines to each other. 
In actuality, the tale of Valentinus, though, is less about romantic love than it's about loving God. The goal of people like Valentinus was to make the love of Jesus known in the world, even if that meant self-sacrifice. As Paul wrote in his second letter to the Corinthians, for while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So what is most important is that the light of love of Jesus can be seen. I think the most important story about the light of Jesus is the transfiguration, which we also celebrate today. In the version of the gospel according to Mark, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up a mountain and there is transfigured into a being of pure light. He is then joined by the souls of Moses, the great lawgiver, and Elijah, the famous prophet. The reason that Jesus did this was because about a week prior, Peter had said that he believed that Jesus was the Messiah, but then balked when Jesus said that he would be crucified. Jesus hoped that his closest disciples could appreciate the truth of this light. However, they still fell short. Peter thinks this is some sort of test of faith and suggests that they build three shrines to Jesus, Moses, and Elijah up there on the mountain. As the gospel says, he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. God then speaks in a cloud for the disciples to listen to their beloved son. Later, Jesus asks that the disciples not tell anybody about the vision until after his resurrection. However, while they obeyed, they still did not understand, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. In many ways, the Jesus of the Transfiguration was Jesus unveiled, as he truly was, a being of light, the divine in human flesh. The Transfiguration indicated that Jesus had come to shine his light over the world. But even Jesus' closest disciples could not accept this reality before God's power had been revealed in the resurrection and before the Spirit had opened their hearts at Pentecost. So much of what Jesus does in the gospel, according to Mark, seems veiled, so that people will not be confused over the truth that he is trying to show them. And when faced with this light of the divine, it is natural for people to be afraid. We feel weak or confused, or we feel like we've done things that we think we should hide from God or others. In the book of Exodus, Moses' face shone after his encounter with God, reflecting God's holy light. Moses was forced to wear a veil to prevent the Israelites from being overwhelmed by this reflected glory. But the true light of God is not one of judgment, but primarily one of love. And in the years after the resurrection, Paul believed that the time for hiding behind veils was gone, and that it was time to, time to shine the true light of one's faith into the world. This is the conclusion he makes in 2 Corinthians. For the last month or so, both in worship and in our Zoom Bible study, we have been looking at Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, written to clarify matters to a church that had become divided over who in the community was better than the others. We see 1 Corinthians today as a masterpiece of vision and love, but apparently not everyone in Corinth at that time agreed. When Paul next visited the city, some of the Corinthian Christians verbally abused him, and no one was brave enough to defend him. Paul left angrily and then wrote a now lost letter in which he expressed his outrage over the failure of the Corinthians to live up to the commandment of love that they received from Jesus. Chastised by their apostle, the morale in the Corinthian church was very low. Meanwhile, Titus, one of Paul's closest colleagues, had been fervently assembling a collection of money to be sent to the church in Jerusalem, which was heavily persecuted and cared for many poor people. Titus was next heading to Corinth, and Paul felt like that connection needed to be improved before someone coming to ask for money would arrive. So Paul wrote the bulk of what we know today as 2 Corinthians to repair his relationship with them by demonstrating his connection to Jesus once again. So when Paul presents his testimony over his accomplishments and why they should still listen to him, 
He does not point to the letters that he's written or to the power of his preaching. He writes instead this, You yourselves are, are our letter, written on our hearts, to be known and read by all. And you show that you are a letter of Christ, prepared by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Paul knows that what is written is not always what is best. Writing for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. He then points out all that all the wisdom of God written down in the Jewish law had been of little value since that written law repeatedly failed to pierce the stony hearts of the Israelites. Even the glowing face of Moses was not enough to convince them. In fact, because they had feared Moses and had forced him to veil himself, they never got any further than that veil when it came to their faith. Paul writes, indeed, to this very day, when they hear the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil is still there, since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Paul has had it with veils and people using their fear or misunderstanding as an excuse not to show love to others. He believes that the power of the Holy Spirit has instead transformed him and the rest of the church into beings whose inward souls shine as brightly as Jesus did on that mountaintop. He writes, And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as through reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Now we are free to shine and reflect God's light and to love into the world around us. But I think many of us are still afraid. We fear that we're not ready or that we're not worthy to shine God's light or that others will tell us to veil ourselves like Moses or will exile us like Elijah or kill us like Jesus. And so we blunt our message to make it acceptable to the ways of the world, to the God of this world, as Paul put it, to the status quo of greed, selfishness, injustice, and division. Paul's solution to this fear is truth and courage. We must be brave enough to speak the truth, even if it might be scary or unpopular to others. He writes, we have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to practice cunning or to falsify God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. And if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In the case of the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And this recalls us back to Paul's original point about providing himself, proving himself again to the Corinthians. He ultimately does not need to prove himself because the testimony that they have received is not about him, nor is it about the Corinthians, nor is it about anybody else who speaks about their faith. The true testimony is Jesus' light shining through them and out into the world, as indeed it can shine out through anybody who accepts that light within. Paul concludes, writing, For it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This Valentine's Day, it will be difficult for us to go out for those expensive dinners or to smell unmasked the aroma of long stem roses. And in some ways, this may be for the best, since it may remind us that the story of St. Valentine is not about physical or romantic love, but about selfless and even sacrificial love, the same love that Jesus showed on the cross. The light of that love is not the flicker of a candle in an intimate dinner, but the shining of divine glory that can be neither hidden by veils nor by excuses. So whether you know it or not, whether you feel it or not, you are all transfigured, glowing within with the glory of God and the power of the Holy Spirit.
Find the courage to own that light, regardless of what others might think. Like Paul, you will show through your deeds, rather than your words, what God is all about. And in doing so, you may save not only yourself, but many people around you, just as Valentinus did. You are the light of the world. And so believe that your light will grow until all people can know the true love of God. That is a valentine that could be sent to anyone. Let us pray. God of true and endless love, these are days when we need wisdom, courage, and compassion. Grant us these and more as we reaffirm our faith in your glory and light. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now our closing hymn this morning is Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. And now may the God who said, let light shine out of darkness and has shone in our hearts, give us light to bear to the world that all may see and know that God is love. Amen. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that of